As Supreme Commander of Allied Expeditionary Forces, General Dwight Eisenhower had under his command the top military men in both Great Britain and the United States to assist him in working out the enormously complex plans for the long-awaited invasion across the Channel. The directive from the Combined Chiefs of Staff was simple, merely instructing us to land on the coast of France and destroy the German forces. The general plan approved as the outline of the operation we intended to conduct was land on the Normandy coast, build up the resources needed for a decisive battle in the Normandy-Brittany region and break out of the enemy's encircling positions. Pursue on a broad front with two army groups emphasizing the left to gain necessary ports and reach the boundaries of Germany and threaten the Ruhr. On our right, we would link up with the forces that were to invade France from the south. Complete the destruction of enemy forces west of the Rhine, in the meantime, constantly seeking bridgeheads across the river. Launch the final attack as a double envelopment of the Ruhr, and follow this up by an immediate thrust through Germany, with the specific direction to be determined at the time. Clean out the remainder of Germany. The heart of Western Germany was the Ruhr. Nowhere else in Europe were their coal deposits equal in quality and so easily workable. For generations, the Ruhr had been mined alternately by Germany and France, as control of the key territory shifted from one country to the other during the succession of Franco-Prussian wars. Each year, millions of tons of coal were mined in the Ruhr and fed into the maw of Germany's heavy war industry. Without the Ruhr's enormous output of coal, the German war machine could not have functioned efficiently. The huge quantities of materiel which had made Hitler's victories in Europe and Africa possible had their origin in the Ruhr. Now, as Hitler's grip on Western Europe was threatened by the Allies, Nazi war machines continued to pour in a steady stream from German factories, whose operation depended largely on the Ruhr. To prepare for the expected invasion, the Nazis began, early in 1944, to strengthen their Atlantic Wall. Its concrete and steel defenses dominated the beaches along the north coast of France. To German high commanders like Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox of North Africa, the Atlantic Wall seemed solid enough to withstand any Allied assault. The Nazi heavy coastal guns and the fortifications themselves were heavily camouflaged in an effort to fool any Allied inspection from the sea or air. On shore, the Nazis felt they were invincible. At sea, in the waters off the French coast, the Germans planted a profusion of mines to block the advance of Allied warships and transports. of 1944, nearly a million Allied soldiers arrived in the United Kingdom, swelling the potential striking force of Allied fighting men there to almost three million. The strength of the Allied air forces in the British Isles had grown from a few thousand planes in early 1942 to more than 15,000 planes of all types. The 5,000 Allied bombers in England were prepared to drop hundreds of thousands of tons of bombs in support of the invasion. The stockpile of vehicles alone for use in the invasion totaled hundreds of thousands of tons. Every available foot of space on overcrowded Britain was used for storage. <laughs> Landing craft of all types were in readiness for the assault on the beaches. We undertook a project so unique as to be classed by many scoffers as fantastic. It was a plan to construct artificial harbors on the coast of Normandy. This mulberry unit was practically a complete harbor.
All over the British Isles, experiments were being conducted with devices only recently developed for combating the German war machine. The British set about the task of designing equipment that would facilitate destruction of German obstacles. They used the area at a secluded spot in eastern England for actual test of the equipment so developed. Heavy rollers for destroying mines were among the many items constantly under test. Senior commanders used every possible moment in visiting and inspecting troops. These visits, sandwiched between a seemingly endless series of conferences and staff meetings, were necessary and highly valuable. The men who were to make the greatest assault in history trained exhaustively under conditions similar to those they would probably meet on the continent. The pre-invasion exercises were much tougher than the maneuvers they had known in the U.S and the men took them much more seriously. The troops gained needed experience in coordinating their simulated attack with that of other units and operating as a well-integrated fighting force. Weapons like the bazooka, used for the first time in World War II, were carefully tested. And the men themselves were toughened up for the invasion in extensive sessions of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. All our preparations were inspected in detail by the highest allied officials. In all our conferences, Mr. Churchill clearly and concretely explained his attitude toward and his hopes for Overlord. He gradually became more optimistic than he had earlier been but he still refused to let his expectations completely conquer his doubts. The paratroopers had been trained to peak condition. Both mentally and physically, they were fit and ready to lead the assault on the enemy in France. Prime Minister Churchill and General Eisenhower were impressed with the performance of the paratroopers. The airborne force to be used in the invasion was the greatest up to that time. More than 13,000 men were to participate on the drop behind the enemy's lines. The air plan, already in execution, called for the progressive wearing down of the Luftwaffe and the destruction of critical points in the rail and highway systems so as to isolate the coastal areas selected for assault. The heavy air blows against the railroads in France began in April, about two months before the tentative invasion date. Bombing attacks against French rail centers were the first step in the disruption of the Nazis' communication system in France. Of course,
USSR bombers did not always escape unscathed. realized that these military objectives in France must be intensively bombed, in spite of the considerable risks to our own air crews and planes. next combination of moon, tide, and time of sunrise that we considered practicable for the attack occurred on June 5th, 6th, and 7th. If none of the three days should prove satisfactory from the standpoint of weather, consequences would ensue that were almost terrifying to contemplate. The good weather period available for major campaigning would become still shorter, and the enemy's defenses would become still stronger. It was a tense period made even worse by the fact that the one thing that could give us this disastrous setback was entirely outside our control. I was particularly pleased to secure the services of Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey as the Naval Commander-in-Chief. He was a most competent commander of courage, resourcefulness, and tremendous energy. Moreover, all of us knew him to be helpful and companionable, even though we sometimes laughed among ourselves at the care with which he guarded in British tradition and practice, the senior service position of the British Navy. During the weeks before D-Day, General Eisenhower devoted as much of his time as possible to visiting the troops who were to participate in the attack on the Nazis' fortress of Europe. At times, I received advice from friends urging me to give up or curtail visits to troops. They correctly stated that so far as the mass of men was concerned, I could never speak personally to more than a tiny percentage. They argued, therefore, that I was merely wearing myself out without accomplishing anything significant so far as the whole army was concerned. With this, I did not agree. In the first place, I felt that through constant talking to enlisted men, I gained accurate impressions of their state of mind. A favorite question of mine was to inquire whether the particular squad or platoon had figured out any new trick or gadget for use in infantry fighting. I would talk about anything, so long as I could get the soldier to talk to me in return. All southern England was one vast military camp, crowded with soldiers awaiting final word to go. The whole area was cut off from the rest of England. The government had established a deadline, across which no unauthorized person was allowed to go in either direction. Every separate encampment and every unit was carefully charted on our master maps. The men prepared to go aboard ship. Some of the last minute haircuts were a little on the close crop side. Many of the men had fathers who served in France in World War I, but never got any farther with the French language than Mademoiselle from Armentiers. Their foresighted sons in World War II were intent on being a little better equipped for those leaves in Paris. Within a week, the troops would be storming the invasion beaches in the greatest military attack in all history. But with final preparations completed, there was time for a few days of relaxation. Finally, during the last days of May 1944, the all-important materiel was moved to the ships. The men were to assemble by the numbers of their ships and all light vehicles and equipment which were to accompany the assault forces and their ships was to be identified in the same manner to avoid any possibility of a mix-up. On June 1st and 2nd, the troops left their camps and headed directly for the ports of embarkation under the strict surveillance of the military police. The scheduled movement of each unit had been so worked out that it would reach the embarkation point at the exact time the vessels would be ready to receive it. 
As the time came for shifting our concentrations toward the ports, the southern portion of England became one vast camp, dump, and airfield. At our request, the British government stopped all traffic between this part of England and the remainder of the United Kingdom. The war-weary British public responded without a whimper to these added inconveniences and privations. The mighty host was tense as a coiled spring, and indeed that is exactly what it was, a great human spring, coiled for the moment when its energy should be released, and it would vault the English Channel in the greatest amphibious assault ever attempted. With D-Day set for June 5th, the weather turned suddenly bad the day before the scheduled assault. Weighing all factors, I decided that the attack would have to be postponed. This decision necessitated the immediate dispatch of orders to the vessels and troops already at sea. However, as the weather cleared, the decision was made to go ahead with the attack on June 6th. Again, I had to endure the interminable wait that always intervenes between the final decision of the high command and the earliest possible determination of success or failure in such ventures. I spent the time visiting troops that would participate in the assault. A late evening trip on June 5th took me to the camp of the U.S. 101st Airborne Division, one of the units whose participation had been so severely questioned by the air commander. I talked to them about anything and everything. If men can naturally and without restraint talk to their officers, the products of their resourcefulness become available to all. Moreover, out of the habit grows mutual confidence, a feeling of partnership that is the essence of esprit de corps. An army fearful of its officers is never as good as one that trusts and confides in its leaders. Found the men in fine fetters many of them joshingly admonishing me that I had no cause for worry, since the 101st was on the job and everything would be taken care of in fine shape. 